the Vilar Perosa. Let's kick things off with the very first submachine guns, because if there's one thing that defines military innovation, it's desperate men in trenches looking for anything that might keep them alive. The Italian Vilar Perosa, designed in 1915, technically holds the title of first submachine gun, though calling it that requires some generous interpretation. This weapon was essentially two submachine guns bolted together on a mount each barrel capable of firing 9mm glissanti ammunition at approximately 1,200 rounds per minute. Now that might sound impressive until you realize that the weapon had no way to fire single shots or controlled bursts. It was full auto or nothing. And at 1,200 RPM per barrel, you'd empty your 25 round magazines in literally about one second of sustained fire. The Italians initially mounted these on aircraft, then on armored cars, then on motorcycles with sidecars, desperately trying to find some role where burning through ammunition faster than a teenager through their first paycheck made tactical sense. The Villar Perosa's design philosophy word, if we can call it that, prioritized rate of fire above literally everything else. Accuracy? Who needs it when you're firing 2,400 rounds per minute controllability? That's tomorrow's problem. Ammunition efficiency? Clearly not an Italian concern in 1915. Eventually, the Italians realized that maybe, just maybe, individual soldiers could use these if they split the weapon in half and added actual stocks. This created the Beretta model 1918, which was actually usable, but by then the war was ending and the whole experiment became a footnote in firearms history. The Villar Perosa's legacy is basically being first, not best, not practical, just first. The MP-18, Germany's Maschinenpistole 18, or MP-18, represents the true birth of the submachine gun as a practical weapon designed by Hugo Schmeisser. In 1918, this weapon established the template that submachine guns would follow for decades, shoulder-fired, magazine-fed, full automatic, and chambered in a pistol cartridge specifically 9 by 19 mm Parabellum. The MP-18's design was remarkably sophisticated for a weapon developed during wartime shortages. It used a simple blowback operation, where the bolt's mass and spring pressure contained the cartridge during firing, no complicated locking mechanisms, no gas systems, just physics and engineering doing their thing. This simplicity meant the weapon could be manufactured quickly by workers who weren't master gunsmiths. The 32-round snail drum magazine, borrowed from the Luger pistol's artillery model, fed ammunition reliably enough for trench warfare, though it was heavy and awkward. The weapon's 9mm parabellum chambering meant ammunition commonality with standard German pistols, simplifying logistics in a military already struggling with supply problems. Germany deployed approximately 35,000 MP18s before the war ended, primarily to Sturmtruppen, stormtroopers who specialized in trench assaults. These soldiers reported that the MP-18 was devastatingly effective in close quarters combat, allowing them to clear trenches and bunkers far more effectively than with bolt-action rifles and hand grenades. The Treaty of Versailles severely restricted German military production after the war, but the MP-18's influence spread worldwide. The design inspired submachine gun development in practically every industrialized nation, establishing 9mm Parabellum as the standard submachine gun cartridge and proving that automatic fire from compact weapons was tactically viable. The Thompson Submachine Gun While the MP-18 was being field tested in European trenches, American inventor John T. Thompson was developing his trench broom on the other side of the Atlantic. The Thompson submachine gun designed in 1918 to 1919 represented American thinking about automatic weapons. Over-engineered, expensive, powerful, and absolutely dripping with mechanical complexity. The original Thompson model, 1921, used the Blish Lock, a delayed blowback system that Thompson believed would control the weapon's rate of fire and improve reliability. In reality, the Blish Lock didn't actually do much. The weapon would have worked fine as a straight blowback, but it added manufacturing complexity and cost. Each Thompson required extensive machining, hand fitting of parts, and quality materials that drove production costs to astronomical levels. The Thompson chambered 45 ACP, the same cartridge used in the M1911 pistol. This gave the weapon substantially more power than 9mm submachine guns. 
A 45 ACP bullet weighs about 230 grains compared to 115 to 124 grains for 9 mm. The increased mass and diameter provided better terminal ballistics at close range, though at the cost of increased recoil and reduced magazine capacity. Feeding systems included 20 and 30 round box magazines plus the iconic 50 and 100 round drum magazines that made the Thompson visually distinctive. The drums were heavy, expensive, and somewhat unreliable, but they provided firepower that box magazines couldn't match. In practice, most users preferred box magazines for their lighter weight and better reliability. The Thompson's accuracy and build quality were exceptional for a submachine gun. The weapon could engage targets effectively out to 100 to 150 meters in trained hands, substantially farther than most contemporary submachine guns. The cut's compensator on the barrel reduced muzzle climb during automatic fire, improving controllability during sustained fire. But the Thompson's fatal flaw was cost, at approximately $200 per unit during the Depression era, equivalent to about $3,500 today. The Thompson cost more than most cars. Law enforcement agencies and criminals could afford them in small numbers, but military procurement at scale was economically impossible. The weapon became famous during Prohibition as the Chicago Typewriter, but military adoption would wait until wartime necessity overrode peacetime economics. The MP-28. Hugo Schmeisser continued developing his MP-18 design during the 1920s, resulting in the MP-28. This weapon addressed many of the MP-18's limitations while maintaining the simplicity that made the original successful. The most significant change was adopting box magazines instead of the awkward drum magazines, improving reliability and reducing weight. The MP-28 featured selective fire capability. Operators could choose semi-automatic or full automatic fire depending on tactical requirements. This was actually revolutionary at the time as most submachine guns were full auto only. The addition of a fire selector made the weapon more versatile and reduced ammunition consumption during operations where rapid fire wasn't necessary. Germany's treaty restrictions meant that German companies manufactured the MP-28 for export markets rather than domestic military use. The weapon saw extensive service with police forces and militaries in Spain, Portugal, China, and numerous South American countries. This export success spread submachine gun technology globally and influenced numerous derivative designs, the PPD and PPSH. The Soviet Union watched Western submachine gun development with interest, eventually creating their own designs that would become some of the most produced firearms in history. The PPD-34 and its successor, the PPD-40, represented early Soviet attempts at submachine gun design. Chambered in 7.62 by 25 mm Tokarev, a powerful cartridge that provided better penetration and range than 9mm. But the real story is the PPSH-41, designed by Georgi Spagen and adopted just as Germany invaded the Soviet Union. This weapon represented a completely different design philosophy than the carefully machined Western submachine guns. The PPSH used stamped steel components wherever possible, minimal machining and manufacturing techniques that could be implemented in factories with limited tooling. The PPSH-41's barrel shroud had cooling holes that doubled as a muzzle brake, reducing muzzle climb during automatic fire. The wooden stock provided durability and was simple to manufacture. The weapon fed from either 71-round drum magazines or 35-round box magazines, with most soldiers preferring drums despite their weight because firepower mattered more than convenience when Germans were invading your homeland. Soviet factories produced approximately 6 million PPSH-41s during World War II, an absolutely staggering number that speaks to both the weapon's manufacturability and Soviet industrial capacity. Entire infantry units were equipped with PPSHS, creating firepower density that German forces found difficult to counter. The weapon's 7.62 by 25 mm cartridge could penetrate the body armor and winter clothing that Germans wore, providing effectiveness that justified its adoption. The PPSH's rate of fire, approximately 900 rounds per minute, was higher than most contemporary submachine guns, providing impressive suppressive fire capability. 
The weapon's chrome-lined barrel resisted corrosion in harsh conditions and improved service life, and the simple blowback operation meant that even minimally trained soldiers could maintain and operate the weapon effectively. The Beretta Model 38 While other nations rushed towards simplified manufacturing, Italy's Beretta took the opposite approach with their Model 38 submachine gun. This weapon represented traditional Italian craftsmanship applied to submachine gun design with extensive machining, high-quality materials, and attention to detail that made it one of the finest submachine guns of the era. The Model 38 featured dual triggers. The front trigger fired semi-automatic, the rear trigger fired full automatic. This provided fire selection without needing a separate selector switch, though it required training to use instinctively under stress. The weapon's precision manufacturing and tight tolerances provided exceptional accuracy for a submachine gun, reportedly capable of effective fire out to 200 meters in skilled hands. But the Model 38's excellence came at a price. The extensive machining required to manufacture each weapon meant production rates were slow and costs were high. Italy produced only about 400,000 Model 38s and its variants during the war, a fraction of the PPSH-41's production numbers. Quality versus quantity. Italy chose quality and found themselves outnumbered. The Sten gun. When Britain found itself alone against Germany after Dunkirk, the military faced a serious problem. They needed weapons immediately, but traditional manufacturing couldn't keep pace with demand. The solution was the Sten gun, designed by Major Reginald Shepard and Harold Turpin at the Royal Small Arms Factory in Enfield, hence the name Sten from the designer's initials plus Enfield. The Sten represented minimalist firearm design taken to its logical extreme. The weapon consisted of a tube for the receiver, a tube for the barrel, a simple bolt, a magazine well welded at a 90 degree angle because it was easier than feeding from below, a wire stock, and almost no other components. The entire weapon could be manufactured for approximately 10 shillings, about $2.50 at the time, using simple stamping, welding, and minimal machining. Early Stenmark I and Mark II variants were crude but functional. The side-mounted magazine made the weapon awkward to handle and prone to damage if the soldier dropped it magazine first, but it simplified manufacturing. The weapon had no safety mechanism initially beyond the bolt handle notches, leading to accidental discharges that gave the Sten a dangerous reputation. But here's the thing about the Sten. It worked. In trained hands with quality ammunition, the weapon was reliable and effective. British commandos, paratroopers, and resistance fighters across occupied Europe used Stens to great effect. The weapon could be suppressed easily due to its simple barrel design, making it popular for covert operations. And when Stens broke, they could often be repaired in the field with basic tools. Britain manufactured approximately 4 million Stens during the war, an incredible production achievement that kept British and Commonwealth forces equipped, despite Germany's industrial advantages. The Sten's crude appearance belied its tactical effectiveness. It was ugly, uncomfortable to shoot, and prone to stoppages with dirty ammunition, but it was available in quantities that mattered. The M3 Grease Gun. The United States learned from Britain's experience with the Sten, creating their own simplified submachine gun designed for mass production. The M3, nicknamed the Grease Gun for its resemblance to mechanics tools represented American industrial engineering applied to weapons design. The M3 improved on the Sten's concepts while adding American manufacturing capability and quality control. The weapon featured a wire stock that could double as a cleaning rod disassembly tool, a magazine housing that fed from below for better balance and handling, and a wraparound bolt that enclosed the barrel for a shorter overall length. The trigger mechanism was ingeniously simple. The weapon had no fire selector. To fire semi-automatic, you pulled the trigger gently. To fire full automatic, you pulled the trigger harder until the disconnector disengaged. This eliminated an entire mechanical system while providing the functionality that military users needed. Manufacturing costs ran approximately $20 per unit, substantially less than the $200 Thompson, despite the M3 being chambered in the same point, 4.5 ACP cartridge. The weapon's rate of fire, approximately 450 rounds per minute, was intentionally slow, improving controllability and reducing ammunition consumption compared to faster-firing submachine guns. The M3's reliability was excellent once production quality stabilized. The weapon functioned in mud, sand, and adverse conditions with minimal maintenance. The simple blowback operation had few parts to break. 
and field maintenance required only basic disassembly. The M3 continued in U.S. military service through the 1990s in vehicle crew and specialized roles, a testament to the design's durability and simplicity. The MP40 Germany's MP40 represents the evolution of Hugo Schmeisser's earlier designs into a refined modern submachine gun suited for mass production. This weapon replaced the expensive MP18 and MP28 with a design that could be manufactured quickly using stamped steel and minimal machining. The MP40's folding stock allowed compact carry by paratroopers, vehicle crews, and troops who needed a secondary weapon. The underfolding design was robust and locked securely in both extended and folded positions. The weapon's balance, with stock extended, provided good handling characteristics for a submachine gun. Manufacturing incorporated stamped steel components wherever possible. The receiver, magazine housing, and trigger group housing all used stamping to reduce production time and cost. The plastic furniture, grips, and magazine housings Further reduced manufacturing complexity, Germany could produce MP40s faster and cheaper than earlier MP18-28 designs while maintaining comparable performance. The 9mm parabellum chambering and 32 round magazines provided standard German submachine gun capability. The weapon's approximately 500 rounds per minute rate of fire was moderate, improving controllability and reducing the tendency to empty magazines in single bursts that plagued higher-rate weapons. Approximately 1 million MP40s were produced during the war, far fewer than Soviet PPSH-41 production, but sufficient for German needs given their different tactical doctrine. German forces issued submachine guns primarily to squad leaders, vehicle crews, and specialized troops, rather than equipping entire infantry units with them as the Soviets did. The MP40's cultural impact exceeded its actual military significance. The weapon became visually synonymous with German forces in popular culture, appearing in countless films and television shows. This visibility created the impression that German forces were universally equipped with MP40 rifles, when in reality they were far less common than Car 98, K rifles Uzi, Israel's Uzi designed by Major Uziel Gal in the late 1940s, represented genuinely innovative thinking about submachine gun design. The weapon's most distinctive feature was its telescoping bolt. The bolt wrapped around the barrel, allowing the weapon to be much shorter than conventional designs while maintaining a long barrel for accuracy and velocity. This overhung bolt design reduced the weapon's length by several inches compared to traditional submachine guns of comparable barrel length. The shorter overall length made the Uzi ideal for vehicle crews, law enforcement, and security personnel who needed compact weapons for confined spaces. The Uzi's grip located magazine well, placing the magazine inside the pistol grip, provided excellent balance and made magazine changes intuitive. The weapon pointed naturally and handled similarly to a large pistol despite being a submachine gun. The centralized mass made the Uzi controllable during automatic fire compared to weapons with forward-mounted magazines. Selective fire capability allowed operators to choose semi-automatic, full-automatic, or on some variants, three-round burst. The grip safety, copied from the M3 grease gun, prevented accidental discharge if the weapon was dropped and the simple blowback operation using stamped steel construction kept manufacturing costs reasonable while maintaining reliability. Israel manufactured Uzis domestically while also licensing production to Belgium's FN Herstal, ensuring availability in global markets. The weapon became enormously popular with military forces, law enforcement agencies, and security details worldwide. The Uzi's compact dimensions and reliability made it the submachine gun of choice for VIP protection and special operations through the 1970s and 1980s. The weapon spawned numerous variants, the Mini Uzi and Micro Uzi, further reduced dimensions for concealment and specialized roles. These compact variants sacrificed controllability and effective range for reduced size, filling niche roles where concealment was paramount. 